Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. I was listening to the Budgetary Committee, and there was an interesting exchange today. It's some information that came to light during the uh, exchange that I wanted to bring to your attention because it, you know, you'll always hear the Liberals talking about how the experts this and the experts that, and you know, Canadians that are supportive of blah blah blah. This gentleman, who is an expert and a Canadian, comes on into the committee and he, well, he pulled no punches. And I want you to hear just how bad his projection for the Canadian economy actually is. It's necessary to expose uh, an argument I've heard for years upon years, it's a fallacious assumption of those who say, look, we're doing something not that different from the European Union, so it can't be all that bad. However, Mario Draghi, the brilliant former ECB governor and premier of Italy, just released his very massive analysis of the existential failings of European Union policies. They have, they have collapsing competitiveness. They have very profound problems. For example, in 2000, the European Union GDP was equal to the same size as the United States GDP. Today, 24 years later, the European Union is 40% smaller than the United States. That's, that's just astonishing. In the words of the Italian Premier, America innovates, China replicates, Europe regulates. And Canada's situation, I believe empirically, if you put the numbers side by side, we are worse off than the EU. So, and I'm just coming to the end, what is to be done? We must explicitly repudiate the failed economic vision that I've been describing. The centralized, top-down, state-directed command and control relying on taxation, subsidies, and protectionism, which is the EU and the Argentine model, and the assumption that it's superior to decentralized, market-driven, privately funded, and privately determined economic decision-making over things like battery plants concerning capital and competition. This is the economic philosophy that underlies the largest, most dynamic, most innovative, most productive economy on planet Earth, the United States. So, members of Parliament, it's not too late to end Canada's holiday from economic history. As Canada has disappeared from economic history. It's funny that he would mention the EU, Argentina, and Canada all in the same breath. They're all um, very, they all have one thing in common. And I thought to myself, where have I heard that before? The comment of Canada and Argentina together. And then I remembered. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina and so on, said so we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was at a, rece at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau. And I would know that half of this cabinet, or even more half of, uh, half of this cabinet, are for our uh, actually young noble leaders of the world. Great form. And that's true in Argentina, too. Well, wow. yeah. Sorry. That's true in Argentina as well. It's true in Argentina. Well, it's true in Argentina, and it's true in Canada, and both of those economies are failing. Both of those economies are shrinking, and yet the top of the people at these countries are getting rich and rich and rich and rich. They have massive um, overinflated governments. They are shrinking the economy, but the top 1% are getting a lot richer until we start to talk about the uh, Canada gains tax or capital gains tax, which, of course, targets farmers and welders more than it, it targets small businessmen more than it targets... It targets those people that are trying to get into the middle class more than it targets anybody else. But I just wanted to point out how there is a common thread. Of course, the other thing the liberals always like to talk about is this uh, foreign investment. And let's hear the uh, what the committee found out about this foreign investment. Okay, so Canada, uh, you said that over the last 10 years, or uh, actually you said nine years, you said since 2015, uh, roughly coinciding with when this government took office, capital in Canada is shrinking. Yes. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? The argument I've been making is, is that because we are in this unique situation, we're right next door to the largest, most powerful, I don't have to repeat all that, um, and it is seen as the risk-free rate of return in the sense it's the one country in the world where wealthy people want to go because they're not worried about being expropriated by their own government. Investors are voting with their feet, 
and they're saying you're not as good as alternatives. Okay. And right now, I believe investors are saying they do not see Canada. It's not that we're a bad country. It's just that there's better alternatives. And better alternatives. And I can take my $90 billion and go to that alternative and make a lot of money and have a lot of money. And I understand that you, you in your, in your, like you might be out there thinking you might be agreeing with the economic model of socialism. The fact of the matter is, is that the people at the top of rungs do not agree with the socialism and math doesn't support the idea. Having that money flee the country because you think in your mind it's going to make houses and groceries less expensive is a flawed logic. Now we'll talk about some of the uh, differences in how the economy is treated in the United States versus how it's treated in Canada, a country that we share a border with, a country that in by all intents and purposes, we should just be mimicking their economic policy and we would be doing just as well as they are. And he said, if you want to know how any economy is going to be doing in about three years from now, look at capital, aggregate capital, private capital investment today, because that's the investment in the factories, the equipment, the technologies that are going to produce the jobs, but there's a lag from the time you start the investment to the time you build it and you get it up and running. So it's a very useful metric for MPs to say, let's look at aggregate private capital investment today and we'll have a pretty good idea how the economy is going to be doing in about three years with a lag of three years. So when you have a deficit and the investment is going down as it's doing, this is a very bad sign because it means we're building less businesses and less investment in the future and in fact all the studies on productivity are showing that we are massively under investing on both worker training and R&D and CapEx in our businesses relative to the US there's no mystery to the productivity crisis okay so this this means that Canada is not getting investment in tools in technology in in IT systems in the kinds of things that workers need in order to make them more productive in order to earn larger paychecks have better paying jobs pay more taxes uh, receive more public services is that Exactly, because we need the cash flow, we need the revenues from taxation to fund the social programs. It's absolutely essential that we create a positive invest, investment climate that encourages businesses and investors to invest here. Okay, for those of you that are listening but might not have a clear understanding of what he said, when he mentions top-down, what he talks about is regulation. That's why Trudeau government has a few friends that get all of the business, right? Like in the, in the example of Mark Carney for... He's saying that because of that, there's no investment on people that are on the outside. They're not coming in here to invest in, in industry. They're not coming in here to invest in um, the population because they would come in and, and you know train the people to do the jobs that need to be done. But because it's all controlled, tightly regulated, like in the EU and like in Venezuela, uh, Argentina, they are looking at the, this problem from how because they are coming into a, a, a country that's heavily regulated and it's not what you know, it's who you know. And no matter the amount of money that you have, you're always going to be stalled in the bureaucracy so that Trudeau's best friends and his buddies can all get ahead of the competition. This creates less foreign investment. This creates less investment at all. And people will simply take the money down into the United States of America where they have 10 times the population and no regulations at all in many cases. They will then turn around and make a profit and move to a nice sunny beach somewhere and forget all about investing in Canada ever. And this is kind of the problem with when you have too many regulations, this is the problem. And of course, the largest issue with socialism and economics is that they are terrified, right? If you start to turn a profit and they don't have a control of you, that means that they don't have a control of you and you can all of a sudden outstrip them in, in influence, which they, they just can't live with. And we, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look it up in any economy on earth. It's the same process every single time, unless you look at straight up capitalism where everybody's trying to make money and because everybody is making money, everybody is paying more taxes. So rather than say to yourself, well, every person that is working, if 50% of the population is paying 40% of taxes of their income into taxes, which is approximately the numbers that we got going on right now. If we were to get that number up to 80% of people working, they could all 
pay 30% or 25% in taxes, and it would still amount to a lot more money, which would then cover the schools, the hospitals, and many of the social programs that you hear the Trudeau government talking about. Because they are good, um, because they are limiting the amount of economy that can be generated, they are in fact limiting the amount of money that's going into the coffers. By tightening the regulations, they also tighten the amount of money that's being made independently outside of their control. So then they make all of these promises on programs and then quietly they cut them. Like the bus, the, it's a great example is the transit system. Every city on in Canada is saying, well, where's the money you promised us for all these green buses? And they're like, well, well, we, we gave some to Toronto. It's really bad. Canada, however, is also part of a, an economic body called the OECD. And it's interesting that the liberal government drives very difficult. Like they are, they never acknowledge it when Pierre Polyev brings it up. But let's just listen to what this expert has to say. Compared to the OECD, which really struck me when I saw that one. I mean, I knew we were always on the short end of the stick compared to the United States. But when I thought that when the OECD are out competing, they're getting a lot more capital per worker than we are compared to the OECD countries. And the OECD countries are high, uh, high taxation countries, high regulation countries. So that's what was so astonishing when we're getting beaten by the OECD. That's a very bad sign. Compared to the OECD, we're doing not that well, and that's a very bad sign, this fellow says. And this is coupled with the fact that we have a deficit in investment, so at least three years from now, the economy will basically collapse, right? So I said, well, let me look it up. And I put in Canada OECD ranking with the economy, give it trigger words. Canada is ranked 26th out of 37 countries in the OECD in business expenditures on research and development as a share of GDP in 2020. This is the Canadian, this institute down here. So I thought, okay, well, let me change the question just a little bit and see how well it, um, see if I can find a different sort of a more current result, right? Because 2020, the argument will be, oh, that was before the pandemic, blah, 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 right? So then I just went ahead and looked a little further down the line and this was the sub question that was asked right you know how sometimes google gives you those that little segment of questions you can just click it open how well is canada's economy the economic growth is tracking slightly better than forecast a quarter ago which is only you know last month really but the objective that best describe adjective excuse me that best described it is subdued our economy is subdued those words are not those don't shouldn't go together Real GDP growth is expected to clock in at 1.1% this year, well below the trending pace of 1.8%. So that would be the global number of 1.8%, and GDP would be at 1.1%, and they struggle to keep the um, cost of living at 2%. So there's a flaw there. It is not a pretty picture for the Canadian consumer where spending is forecast to remain tepid. And that was released on September 19th of 2024. So that is, in, that is current information. And it was released by the Toronto Dominion. So this isn't, you know, some guy, uh, some keyboard warrior somewhere, and this isn't news that's old. This is current stuff, and we are in a bad way. So don't let them stand up in the House of Commons and try to talk to you about soft landings or any of the of the catchwords that they hope you'll that you won't understand but you'll fall for. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.